got myself some wisdom from a leather bag book got myself a savior when i took a second Opened up the pages And what did I find? A black and white portrait of a king Who's a friend of mine Funny how when you think you're right Everybody else must be wrong Till someone with fool's wisdom Somehow comes along His voice was strange and the words he said I didn't quite understand Yet I knew that he was speaking right By the leatherback book in his hand Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. Welcome to Word for the Weekend here on RTN, Christian TV and radio. My name is James Jacob Prash. RTN is Scotland's leading Christian internet TV and radio platform coming to you from Scotland to Britain to the world. We are in this for Jesus. We're in it to reach the lost, and we're in it for you. Please tell your friends about RTN. And please avail yourself of our resources, social media, podcasts, internet radio, internet TV, a range of Bible expositors, evangelists, very edifying Christian music. We are here for the times in which we live. But thank you so much once again for joining us. Once more, my name is James Jacob Prash from Morial Ministries. And we are one of the channels here on RTN, but there are a number. I will be, uh, I'm in the United States at the moment at our base in Tennessee, but we will be leaving the day after tomorrow for speaking engagements in Northern, Central, and Southern Florida. In Northern, Central, and in Southern Florida. We will be in the Naples area, we will be in the uh, Tampa area, and we will be in Miami, Fort Lauderdale, Dade area. The dates are on the Morio website, morio.org, or you can just Google Morio itinerary. If you're in Florida, either north, central, or south, we'd be more than happy to see you within the forthcoming week. After that, we shall be in California and back again in New York, Baltimore, followed by dates in Britain, in the north of England and Cheshire, and in Essex. In any event, our website is moriel.org, or you can just Google Moriel itinerary. 
Again, we'll be more than happy to see you. Look with me, please, as we look at mix, mixture, and mixed up. God has a problem with mixture. He has a problem that he restates repeatedly for several reasons in the various texts. One that we always look at is the final church before Jesus comes, the church of Laodicea. The lament of the Lord is an indictment of what the church will be like at the close of the age. And he states the following, the church of Laodicea, I know your deeds that you were neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spit you out of my mouth. I've been to Laodicea a number of times. It is in Turkey. In the first century, it was the Roman province of Asia. It was a Greek-speaking area then. But it is very, very well excavated now. Then you can see the Roman aqueduct coming down from a place called Pamukkala, where the hot springs are, going into Laodicea, into the local water tables, where there's fountains and pools. And there are pools with warm water, hot water, pools with cold water, and pools where the two mix, and the water is lukewarm. There's an elaborate fountain, well excavated in the middle, with the water coming out. Fantastic place to visit, and it helps bring to life the background of what's being described in the text of Revelation chapter 3. Hot water, cold water, but the mixture, the Lord just spit it out. He hates the mixture. You know, <clears throat> we have churches that are on fire for the Lord. We have churches that have gone into heresy and apostasy. But then we have this curious mixture, which mainstream Protestantism and much of mainstream evangelicalism seems to have become. Another example of <clears throat> what God hates would be found in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33. For well, God is not a God of confusion, but of peace as in all the churches of the saints. Where you have confusion, you have a mixture of things that should not be confused, should not be mixed, should not be haphazardly integrated. <clears throat> confusion. More of that in a moment. Another one, of course, that we've looked at a number of times is 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. The false prophets arose among the people, as there will be false teachers among you. Remember, the reason it uses false teachers and false prophets interchangeably, as if they were synonymous, is simple. If someone's doctrines are false, their prophecies are going to be false. False prophets will always have false doctrine. Just as there were false teachers among you, there'll be false prophets, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, We've talked about this before. Para Sogzusin. Para Sogzusin. They put truth next to error. And those who do this use truth to camouflage error. Every cult does this. Jehovah's Witnesses do this. Mormons do this. They say true things and use true things to camouflage things that are toxic, false, poisonous. The Roman Catholic Church is based on this. It places truth next to error. Truth is placed next to error. And that when they do this, they covertly, secretly introduce destructive heresies. It becomes schismatic, a false doctrine that results in some kind of schism, that they will even deny the master who bought them. One example of this is the book, The Shack, that so many Christians were deceived into reading. It was written by William B. Young, a man who denies penal substitution 
He denies substitutionary atonement. He denies that Jesus died in our place. He denies that the Lord Jesus took our sin and died in our place. He denies it. He denies the master who bought him. Now, Jesus died to buy us back, to ransom us. He denies this. No, Jesus did not die for sin. This is what he teaches. Yet many Christians were deceived into reading that book. Parasogzusin. Oh, I was so blessed, and there were things in it that encouraged my soul. Parasogzusin. Truth next to falsehood. Error is used to disguise, is disguised or is, is camouflaged by things that are true. And naive, undiscerning, gullible people believe it. We are warned. God hates that mixture. But what I'd really like to focus on, please, is Deuteronomy chapter 22. Deuteronomy chapter 22. These New Testament passages, all indirectly at least, derive from what God says about the mixture in the 22nd chapter of the book of Deuteronomy. I will begin in verse 9. You shall not sow your vineyard with two kinds of seed. Lest all the produce of the seed which you have sown and the increase of the vineyard become defiled. You shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together, and you shall not wear a material made of wool and linen together. You shall make for yourself tassels of the four corners of your garment with which you will cover yourself. The tassels, 613 of them, one for each commandment of the Torah. But don't mix the seed. Don't plow with an ox and a donkey together. Don't wear material that is both wool and linen. How do we understand this? Mixing the seed is something that God was very emphatic about. Now, again, I'm not against science. I'm not against biogenetic engineering. We have things like grapefruit only because people mix two different citrus plants. But we understand something. Biogenetic engineering will ultimately be used for evil. And on our teaching, which is quite old now, but we warned about it 30 years ago nearly, it will be used by fallen man under the influence of Satan. There will be a reappearance of demonoids on the earth before Jesus comes back. It'll be just as in the days of Noah, when the Nephilim came. Now, this is a separate subject. I don't want to go into it now, but beware of mixing this seed. What will happen when you begin cloning, cloning human beings and try to genetically engineer human beings? Where will their spirit come from? They will wind up with some kind of demonoids, but again, this is not our subject now. Just beware of it. So too, Antichrist, he will says they will mix in the seed of men. They will mix in the seed of men. What did the Nephilim do? In the Hebrew, he pulled the fall. These angelic beings who were fallen, fallen angelic beings, they procreated with humans, creating the Geborim, the Anakim, creating monsters. And then God destroyed the earth in the days of Noah. Somehow that is going to happen again. You mix this seed. You've got the seed of the woman. I'll put enmity between the, you and the woman, your seed and her seed. This ultimately points to a spiritual conflict. We have other re recorded teachings exploring this in greater depth. So too, the parable of the sower and the seed. You plant good seed, but then the enemy comes and plants tares. The enemy comes and plants tares. Satan plants tares. The gospel is the good seed. The enemy plants tares. Don't have them in the same field. Do not have people 
planting bad seeds. People with a different gospel are accursed. You cannot have people who plant a different seed. You shall not plow, plow with an ox and a donkey together. Remember, do not muzzle the ox when he's threshing. There is much strength, or there is much good from the strength of the ox, the scripture tells us. An ox is a picture of a faithful teacher. Don't muzzle the ox when he's threshing. But then there's a donkey. Don't have a donkey and an ox together. Do not listen to good teachers and bad ones. Do not listen to faithful expositors of the word and heretics or people who are just jackasses. The internet is literally filled with people who the word of God compares to jackasses. They speak absolute nonsense rubbish. Ridiculous things. You can hear the words of a jackass. Those who plow with the ox should not link that ox to a donkey. Don't listen to a good teacher, and then go listen to a false one. You shall not wear material mixed of wool and linen together. Wool is a sheep, comes from sheep. God made it. Jesus is the Lamb of God. Salvation is entirely his work. It is not something that we do. Linen is made from flax. Linen is a different kind of fabric, and it is made by people from flax. People make it. Salvation can only come from the Lamb. It cannot come from anything we do ourselves. Wool is wool. Linen is linen. Linen has its purpose. It can be used for good in other contexts. But salvation can only come from the Lamb of God, from something that God makes, God does. Prepare thou a body for me, the Lamb of God. Synergism, the idea where salvation is a combination of what we do and what God does. No. What we do is a result of what God does. As we always say, Christians do good works because they have been saved, not to get saved. Salvation is purely from the Lord. Repeatedly, we are told God hates a mixture. God hates a mixture. And a mixture, we're told in Corinthians, will result in confusion. People will not know what to believe or what to do. A indirect reference text to this is in Corinthians, when the bugle, the salapigo in Greek, makes indistinguishable or indistinct sounds, the people won't know what to do in the heat of battle. There's something I look at periodically. They email me things. It's not something I'd recommend, but I look at what they're saying. It calls itself premierchristianity.com. And I was going through it recently, premierchristianity.com, well known in Britain. And there's a series, an endless series of articles putting across utterly contradictory positions. Sometimes it has good Bible expositors. It has an ox. But in the same edition of the same publication, it will have a jackass. People saying crazy things simultaneously. You've got people who bought into the woke agenda. Is the Church of England still institutionally racist? No, it is not. No, it is not. That is just an issue that people have trumped up that brings unnecessary division to the body of Christ. I'm not an Anglican, but I don't know of any racists 
in the Anglican clergy or hierarchy. And I don't even like such people. It goes on. A luxury Lenten retreat for 950 pounds. Come on, Canterbury Cathedral, you can't be serious. I understand Christian conferences, we have them. And I understand residential conferences where you have accommodation to be provided for people that involves laundry services, bed linen and so forth, and it involves meals. It involves catering. And there's a cost. But when you have a retreat for 950 pounds for a few days, it's not good. It goes on. Talking about what's happening in the Ukraine and the Middle East, a good article. Picture of soldiers, Jesus said, do not be afraid of wars and rumors of wars. That's a responsibly written article, biblically based. But then, who is Mike Bickle and what are the allegations against him? We warned about Mike Bickle in 1990 when he first came to Britain. When he brought the Kansas City false prophets over here, all over to Britain. Paul Kane, Bob Jones, crazy people, immoral people. Should anybody be surprised that Bickle has for decades been a sexual predator, even with underage young girls? What took them so long? We are contending for what we saw at Asbury and more in the UK. Asbury was another one of those pseudo revivals that came and amounted to nothing. There was no revival. There was not a large number of people getting saved and repenting for their sins. It follows no biblical or historical pattern of any revival. But you've got the jackasses pulling the plow. Exclusive Church of England bishops offer theological vision on Christian life and discipleship the same week when they publish their intentions to have a liturgical blessing on same-sex relationships. What do C of E bishops know about Christian life and discipleship? What kind of a theological vision can such people possibly have other than a wrong one, a convoluted one? Should Christians attend the same-sex wedding? It's a complex issue, says John Stevens, but not one we should divide over. It is not a complex issue. Read Romans chapter 1. There's no complication or complexity at all. God says it's wrong. And those who will in any way lend credence or sanction to it are in rebellion against the Lord, such as Mr. Begg. We shouldn't divide over it? Yes, we should. They're compromising with something that God says is abominable, unnatural, unacceptable to the Lord. Yes, we should divide over it. We divide over serious, unrepentant sin. There's political attacks on Suella Braverman over her position on refugee immigration. They love to associate those who are warning about immigration of people from Islamic countries and so forth, associating that with racism. 
But they overlooked the fact that Suella Braverman herself, who's a Roman Catholic background, is an Asian woman. She is not a Caucasian. She's not Anglo-Saxon, Anglo-Celtic. She herself is an Asian. It goes on. More articles. How Valentine's Day and Lent both point to God's perfect love. Valentine's Day and Lent. How to be a good witness in a modern multicultural society. All right. Christians don't have to choose between love and justice. That is right. Love and justice are not contradictory. No problem. It goes on. Don't forget about Palestinian Christians like me writes Jack Nasser. The plight of persecuted Palestinian Christians is being forgotten, including among Christians in the West. Who is persecuting them? The Israelis don't persecute Arab Christians, the Muslims do. The National Prayer Breakfast was a reminder of gospel hope amid political division. There's Joe Biden, radical promoter of homosexuality and lesbianism, and of the same-sex agenda, gender pronouns, the whole bit, and a radical promoter of late-term abortion, speaking at the National Prayer Breakfast. What does he have to speak to people about concerning prayer? But we're told it's a reminder of the gospel of hope. That's absurd. It goes on. The death of Gazans has reached biblical proportions. Christians must speak out against it. An article published in Premier says, it has not reached biblical proportions. Nothing like it. The statistics that are being adopted and promoted by this so-called journalist, George Pitcher, and this guy writes ridiculous things, are provided by Hamas. They're Hamas's own statistics. Most of the civilian casualties in Gaza are because Gaza is using its civilians, including its children, as human shields. Christians must speak out. The leaders of Hamas in Qatar stated, the Koran says we must find every Jew, not every Israeli, every Jew, and kill them. We're doing this because of our religion. We must kill the Jew, says Hamas. And then we must kill the Christian. One of the three top leaders, elder statesman of Hamas, said that in Qatar in October. They came into Israel, murdered 1,300 people, raped young girls, murdered babies in cribs, killed children. When the Israelis fight back, the Israelis are the victims. Hamas has stated, from the river to the sea, we do not want a two-state solution. We want to eradicate Israel, and there will be more October 7th attacks. They said that. So you have a Christian moron, if he is a Christian. I know he's a moron. I don't know if he's a Christian. George Pitcher, 
Christians must speak out because the Israelis are not allowing Hamas to live to fight again. He's not giving them, the, Israel's not giving them the chance to carry out their promise to continue their jihad and to per per perpetrate more October 7th attacks. We must speak out. I have said this before. People in England were very angry about what the Luftwaffe did to Coventry. They were very angry about what the V-2 rockets did to London. So angry that the RAF leveled Dresden, Germany and killed a lot of German civilians. The Royal Navy shelled Hamburg, Germany at close range. They were angry. Nobody in England and nobody in the Church of England and no religious nitwit said the British were unjustified for what they were doing. Yodel, Hitler's deputy, complained, you're killing women and children. Yet what about the women and children of Coventry in London? Two standards. This is a religious buffoon. He's a silly religious buffoon. The Israelis have every right to do to Gaza what the British did to Dresden and Hamburg. They don't have a choice. Hitler would use German civilians as human shields, and Hamas uses civilians as human shields. They killed British civilians. They killed British women and children and used their own as shields. What, the British shouldn't defend themselves? Britain committed no war crimes in what they did to Dresden and Hamburg, and Israel has committed no war crimes. George Pitcher is either a liar or a moron, probably both. I'll debate that moron anywhere. I'll happily debate George Pitcher. I consider him to be a religious buffoon. It goes on. Jesus doesn't want you to follow your dreams. Well, it depends. If your dream is a dream he gave you. Now there's a good article by Bernard Randall. I was fired for my sermon on LGBT issues but I'll not apologize for speaking the truth. Former school chaplain Bernard Randall says he was sacked for gross misconduct and reported to the government's anti-terrorism program after delivering a sermon which contained views on sexuality that were Christian. That's very valid. The complicated case of Russell Brand's conversion. Russell Brand, after being accused of sexual offenses, when was his conversion? Why get into this? Now, there are celebrities whose faith is unquestionable whose personal beliefs and personal moral integrity are unquestionable. There are. It was George Best in the world of soccer, football. It's certainly Helen Shapiro, the pop singer. There's a lot of people like that. David Suchet, the actor. Yes, there are Christians who are celebrities who are saved, and they speak up for the Lord and their faith within their professions. But why would you go look at somebody with these kinds of scandals surrounding them? 
Here's another one. Why Christians should oppose the banning of Muslim prayer in schools? Allahu Akbar. Daniel Webster. Not the Daniel Webster. Another Danny Webster from the Evangelical Alliance. Why Christians should oppose banning of Muslim prayer in schools. This is the Evangelical Alliance? I left that stupid organization decades ago. Christians should oppose banning Muslim prayer in schools. We should defend the rights of other religions to pray. What happened to I am the Lord your God? You'll have no gods before me. Silent prayer, personal prayer may be one thing. But having people kneel down and face Mecca? At the taxpayer's expense or even in C of E schools? Or any school? Here's another article complaining that evangelicals in America, many of them are backing Donald Trump. I voted for Mr. Trump twice. He was the most sympathetic to evangelical concerns. He was the most pro-life. He stood up for the persecuted church more than any other president. And he stood up for Israel in the face of Islamic terror. He moved the American embassy to Jerusalem. I voted for him twice. I will not be voting for him the next time simply because I suppose for political reasons, he hosted a homosexual and lesbian gala in his Mar-a-Lago estate. I'm not going to support him again, vote for him again. I'm certainly not going to vote for Biden or whoever, but I'm not going to vote for Mr. Trump. I wish I could, but I can't. But to complain that most evangelicals are backing him, he stood up for the persecuted church. He's the only president who stood up the way he did against abortion and appointed Supreme Court justices who were pro-life and reversed Roe versus Wade. You hate him for that? Of course most evangelicals back him. Why would they not? Now a good article. Dawkins dodges a debate again. I consider Dawkins to be an extremely bad apologist for atheism. I don't blame him. There are many creation scientists who could easily and have easily made a monkey out of him. Now there's an article also I like. I used to think anti-Semitism was the past problem. But Christian reactions to Gaza have changed my mind. That's a good article. Here's an article on why Christian parents of LGBT kids are afraid to talk. They're too scared to admit that they hold traditional views and they disagree with their children. That's a good article. The Methodist church is wrong. Husband and wife are not offensive terms. The Methodist, the church founded by John Wesley, has adopted inclusive language guides, replacing husband and wife with gender neutral terms. So as not to offend homosexuals and lesbians and to include them. I wouldn't ask what John Wesley would think. It's good that there was an article written addressing the absurdity and the hypocrisy of British Methodism. It goes on. Process isn't sexy, but it matters. The church is in a mess over same-sex blessings. It is.
Then it goes on. The Pope's guidance on same-sex blessings will cause confusion by Peter D. Williams. Well, he's certainly right. Good article. New transgender guidance for schools isn't a victory for Christians. That's true. It goes on. Why Christians need to stop judging celebs or celebrities who talk about Jesus? Wait a minute. If someone with a public profile in the public eye speaks about Jesus Christ, they've done it to draw attention to their beliefs about Jesus Christ. That's why they've done it. To say that Christians should not judge what they say? We should judge anything anybody says about Jesus Christ on the basis of Scripture. But some guy who calls himself an evangelist named Linz West says we shouldn't do that. We're too quick to judge the faith of a high-profile person. Well, in one sense, he's right. If somebody talks about Jesus, oh, they're saved, they're a Christian, they're a believer, they may not be. He's right. But you can't say that we should stop judging. We have to judge. Is what they said about Jesus scriptural or not? There are a lot of people professing to be Christian who believe things and say things about Jesus that are simply not scriptural. The Church of England has lost the trust of church abuse survivors. Probably has. Here's one. A talented guy, or he had serious problems with alcohol addiction. Shane McGowan. People miss the point of Christmas. It's supposed to be about Jesus, the faith of Shane McGowan. Now, I'm, I happen to think that the, the Pogues were talented. And I watched the clips of his funeral in a Roman Catholic church, which they call a chapel in Ireland. And the coffin was there, and what the Catholics considered to be the Blessed Sacrament was there, and they had people singing his songs. And he usually sang while he was intoxicated on alcohol possibly other things. And they're singing at his funeral in the church. You scumbag, you maggot, you chief lousy faggot, happy Christmas, your ass. Well, this is what they're singing in the church. He was a man who needed Christ. He was a man who needed to be delivered from the power of alcohol. He was addicted to something that has devastated Celtic people, Welsh, Irish, Scottish. Somehow there's an endemic cultural problem with alcohol abuse among Celts. Bearing in mind my mother's Irish, I'm not picking on Celts. But why would you talk about it as a kind of Christian figure? The man needed to get saved. Here's another one. Jane Ozan, oh my lord. Why sex outside of marriage is not a salvation issue. Outside are fornicators. They're not going to heaven unless they repent and get saved. 
adultery, fornication, unnatural sexual relations. Why sex outside of marriage is not a salvation issue. This woman is a religious liar and a theological ignoramus. It is a salvation issue. I shacked up with my girlfriend in New York. Thank God we both got saved. Otherwise, we'd both be heading to hell. And with my drug abuse, I might be there already. It is a salvation issue. She is lying. Her only plea might be she doesn't know what she's talking about and she's ignorant of the word of God. No fornicator shall enter the kingdom of God. Sex is for marriage. It goes on. Why we need the hope of Advent? We need the hope of Advent? Nobody knows the year, let alone the day when Jesus was born. Where is there a season of Advent in Scripture? Here's a good article by Ben Phillips. He's going at some woman named Alice Roberts. He says she's wrong. Faith schools, meaning Christian schools, save money. They do. They save the taxpayer money. And they're not indoctrinating anyone. Good article. These C of E devotionals are lightweight, haphazard, and verging on heresy. We can do better, writes Peter Ould. Peter is right. Here's an account of someone who was in a church called Soul Survivor that had a scandal. And one of the complaints about the church most vocalized by people who left it was spiritual abuse. Fair to address that. But then we get another article by Emma Fowle. Don't be a Grinch. Denying Santa is a bad evangelism strategy. To tell your children that Christmas is when people observe the nativity, the birth of Jesus who came to save our sins. Santa Claus is not real. I know a lot of Christian parents who tell that to their children. We taught it to our children. That makes you a Grinch. Shouldn't deny Santa Claus, you're a Grinch. Someone's standing outside of a school in America with a placard. Santa is fake. Jesus is real. That might be the truth, but it's not a great way to share your faith this Christmas. Well, it might not be the best evangelistic strategy to reach unsaved people. But to say denying Santa Claus makes you a Grinch. We interrupted a church service to protest climate change. Standing up for the poor is more important than anything. Holly Anderson Peterson says that far from being unchristian, it's more important than anything. What's more important than anything is being saved is being born again, is escaping hell, is eternal life. Read the Bible. Yes, God put man on the earth to take care of it. But apart from the scientific arguments concerning climate change and the arguments against it, as well as arguments by the proponents for it, 
the earth and the works that are upon it are going to be burned up. It's not more important than anything. What's more important is salvation. But this silly, ridiculous woman from an organization called Christian Climate Action says that even though the Word of God says the planet is doomed, that mankind is doomed, preach the gospel. No. We should interrupt church services. And that's more important than anything, to push our climate agenda. Why would you let someone like that write this in a Christian magazine? Now, a good article by Joseph D'Souza, an Asian brother. Radical Islam is a threat to Christian democracy. It must be defeated. That's true. Then someone else comes, John Stevens. He says correctly, why sex outside of marriage is a salvation issue. One says one thing, one says another. Now you can have a newspaper with an op-ed page where two different editorialists will put across different positions on an issue in a secular publication. But this is a voice for the Christian church. People saying diametrically opposite things. Half of people no longer want a funeral. It's a worrying trend. Why? It's up to them. If their final wishes is not to have a funeral, so what? The only good thing about a funeral is it's a chance to preach the gospel to unsaved family and friends of the person who gave up the ghost. That's the only good thing about it. Look at the death of Ananias and Sapphira. What did Peter say? Take him out and bury them. There was no funeral. There was no funeral. You can't make this a Christian issue. I'm not against someone having a funeral, but I'm not against somebody saying they don't want one. Here's a fair article by James Patrick. Israel, Gaza war. Don't ignore what the Bible actually says. Here's a good article about Christmas by Mark Deacon. The elf on the shelf is the antithesis of Christmas. Let's get rid of him. Using Christmas to address the abortion issue. Who will fight for today's holy innocence? Good article. Why the church in Bethlehem has canceled Christmas? I'll tell you why. Because Bethlehem was formerly an Arab Christian town that was taken over by Muslims. I recall when Yasser Arafat threatened the former Christian mayor of Bethlehem, Mayor Frege, and said, I'll fill you full of lead if you don't do what we say. Islam is taking control of Bethlehem. The church of the nativity is under their thumb. I'll tell you a true story. I was opposite Bethlehem, looking at Bethlehem at a large window from a place called Ramat Rachel, opposite side of the valley from Bethlehem. I was there. I was watching this. Muslim terrorists took over the Church of the Nativity, looted the religious artifacts. Again, it's not an evangelical church. Looted the religious artifacts and were holding 
Eastern Orthodox monks, hostage at gunpoint. The Israelis surrounded it. Some of the Israeli soldiers were coming over to the hotel I was staying at, and the hotel was letting them in the jacuzzis during their break time. It was winter. It was a bit cold. I speak Hebrew. I was talking to the soldiers. And I'm watching a pack of lies on CNN, what the soldiers are telling me what was really happening, and I could see some of what was happening, the shooting and so forth. The Israelis were negotiating with the terrorists, trying to get the monks free. They were trying to get the terrorists to release the monks. CNN reported this as a siege by the Israelis. The next day, the next day, the owners of CNN, Time Warner, had what was the biggest stock plunge in history up to that time, 54 million in a single day. How couldn't they lose 54 billion in a single day? Well, they did. I'll bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. There's a conflict in the Middle East. Even nominal Christians, much worse for born-again Christians, but nominal Arab Christians, Assyrian Christians, Eastern Orthodox Christians, Maronite Catholic Christians, are all being driven out of their homes the villages where they've lived for centuries by Islam, all of them. Israel is the only country in the Middle East that is protecting the rights of Arab Christians, really, in any meaningful way. They're even persecuted in the more moderate Muslim countries like Jordan and Egypt. They're safe in Israel because of the Israelis. You have Islamic intimidation even of nominal Christians. Here's an article by someone called Mark Woods, What the Bible Says About the Israeli-Gaza War. In a recent speech, Benjamin Netanyahu invoked the words of Ecclesiastes, there's a time for war as justification of military's operation. But this is an appropriate use of scripture. It's complicated. No, it isn't. When someone murders babies in cribs and prams, rapes your little girl, murders your wife, abducts your kid sister, it's a time for war. The New Testament never forbids self-defense. If you know what time the thief was coming, you'd be ready for him, Jesus said. It's just religious claptrap. Here's an article by a liberal evangelical. That should be a contradiction in terms. David and Stone Brewer. This guy's got some serious problems theologically. I consider him to be a pseudo-scholar. Is the Prince of Persia causing chaos in Gaza? Yes, he is. And he's causing chaos in Lebanon. And he's causing chaos in Iran. And he's causing chaos in Iraq. And he's causing chaos in Syria. And he's causing chaos in Yemen. Here's a good article. C of E leaders are walking together into sin. It's a bad joke. Says Andrea Williams. She's absolutely right. They're blessing same-sex marriages. Andrea Williams is absolutely right. But here's the next one. Ed Shaw. Why I won't quit the C of E. 
despite the chaos over same-sex relationships. I don't care that Jesus said, come out of her, my people. I don't care that the word of God says it's an abomination. I won't quit. His justification? I would feel like I was handing over our national church to error. Your national church was handed over to error a long time ago. It's time for true believers in the Anglican Church to leave it and reorganize as an independent Anglican communion. You've got conservative Anglicans in Africa. Apart from the heirs of Desmond Tutu, most of the Anglicans in Africa are conservative, and many of them are born again. You have conservative Anglicans in Asia. The remnant of conservative Anglicans, particularly the born-again ones in England, should reorganize and break with Lambeth, break with Canterbury. You want that habit? We're leaving. We're not giving you another sixpence. Because the Anglican Synod knows that the church attendance is higher among evangelical Anglicans than it is among liberals and Anglo-Catholics. Now, of course, in Anglican circles, it's Triludian. And evangelical in the Church of England does not necessarily mean born again. It only has to mean not Catholic, as an Anglo-Catholic, and not theologically liberal. Why would believers stay there? People like Luther, Wesley, and J.I. Packer were effectively excluded by existing denominations. Yeah, if you stay there, they're going to kick you out, and the only reason they haven't is because they need your money. If you're against the same-sex stuff, if you're against the ordination of homosexual and lesbian clergy, why are you paying for it? Why are you taking money given by believers and contributing to an Anglican diocesan system to fund these bishops? who are ordaining homosexuals and lesbians and placing benedictions on same-sex relationships. Are you a hypocrite? Are you a coward? Or are you really that ignorant of the word of God? Ed Shaw is a member of the Synod. I'm not leaving! Good, stay there. Jesus said, come out of her, my people. Contradiction and contradiction. One says one thing, one says another. West Streeting, MP, my faith made it very difficult to accept my sexuality. Uh, if your sexuality is homosexual, and you have a real faith in Jesus, you're going to ask him for the power to reorient you. I know people who the Lord has delivered from homosexuality and lesbianism. I know saved Christian brothers and sisters in Christ who used to be that. My faith made it difficult to accept my sexuality. What does that make you, a victim? Here's another one. Dr. Augustine Tanner Im. Evangelicals are obsessed with sex, but Christians should be marked by our love for the poor. Why are those two things mutually exclusive? The Bible speaks about the poor, and the Bible speaks about sexual morality. Why are those two things mutually exclusive, you religious buffoon? Why don't you shut up and go get an honest job? You're not a preacher. Creates confusion. Remember, the biggest need of a poor person is the same as the biggest need of a rich person. Salvation. 
The biggest need of a sick person is the same as the biggest need of a healthy person, salvation. It goes on. One article saying one thing, another article saying another. Here's an obituary for a deceiver who was anointed by Satan to corrupt the charismatic movement of the Church of England. It's the obituary for Bishop David Pitches, former vicar of St. Andrew's Trollywood. He wrote the book, Some Said It Thundered, telling people to follow the Kansas City false prophets of Mike Bickle, such as the alcoholic, homosexual, pedophile, Paul Kane, and the womanizer, Bob Jones. Some said it thundered. He promoted these deceivers. Proven false prophets, false teachers. He promoted them. He told Anglican evangelical charismatics to follow them. I watched the video of David Pitches at St. Andrew's Trolley Wood. I'm not exaggerating. There were all kinds of people doing crazy things. There was some woman standing there like this, imitating a bird. He said that was the Holy Spirit. He had people doing crazy things on the floor. And some guy runs up and grabs the microphone and says, the Lord says we need this to reach the poor and oppressed. It's going to reach the poor and the oppressed. There's a woman standing there with broken glasses on. She was wearing lenses, but the uh, frames, but they were twisted and the lenses were broken. And she's standing there with a big black gashed eye, giggling. And she's standing there, giggling, standing next to David Pitchers. And on this video, he asked what happened. And she said, somebody got slain in the spirit and fell on me. <laughs> the woman needed medical attention, and she's standing there laughing. Somebody thinks they got slain in the spirit and they fell and damaged. God did that? Then some guy, David Pitcher, goes, my word, what is this? And some guy is jumping up and down. And David Pitcher said, see, this is pogo sticking in the spirit. Pogo sticking in the spirit. And the guy's standing there, and he's jumping up and down next to Pitches. And Pitches asks him, how long has this been going on? And he says something like, since last Thursday. And the guy's jumping. And he says, Pitches asks him, what do you do when you have to go to work? And he says, nothing. I work for the church. They pay somebody to jump up and down like a This man had the mind of an imbecile, not a congenital imbecile, not somebody with a natural lack of intelligence. He was a willful imbecile. He was a religious imbecile. Calling that a revival? Misleading the people of God, the church of God, the children of God? Pogo sticking, people getting injured, people imitating loony birds, telling them it was a revival, and writing a book telling them to follow homosexual pedophiles and drunks who he said were prophets, womanizers. David Pitches, former vicar of St. Andrews. Greg Downs pays tribute to a pioneer of charismatic renewal, paying tribute to a psycho, to a religious psycho, 
there was something wrong with David Pitchers spiritually. He was spiritually deceived, and he was used of Satan to deceive others. Well, some other Anglican comes out and says, why I still believe the Church of England's prayers for same-sex couples won't work. Sean Doherty is right, but it doesn't have to be said. It shouldn't have to be said. Oh, my Lord. Bringing home a national treasure, a crowdfunding campaign has raised over a half million pounds to bring a tapestry commissioned by Henry VIII and dubbed the birth certificate of the Church of England back to the UK. If anybody read about Henry VIII, who killed 70,000 English people, his own subjects, killed 70,000, they would know the Church of England was not born out of Christian conviction. He opposed the Reformation. He urged Erasmus of Rotterdam to oppose the followers of Luther. He had Cardinal Wolsey murder William Tyndale. He had Thomas More opposing the English translations of the Bible. When the Pope, for political reasons, would not approve his divorce of Catherine of Aragon, then he turned Protestant. Only then. It was about his desire to divorce and marry another woman, no biblical grounds for it. It's about politics, obviously, but it was not about conviction or Jesus or the gospel. Now he closed down the corrupt monasteries and he allowed Bibles to be chained into English churches. That is true. But his essential beliefs remained Catholic minus the Pope. The Church of England was born out of the whoredom of a corrupt king. It was not born out of the Word of God. The Church of England was born out of the whoredom of a corrupt king. Now one can argue that later, Ridley, Latimer, Hooper, Coverdale came and reformed it. Thomas Cramer, you can argue that it had a reformation after Henry, but the birth certificate under Henry VIII, it had nothing to do with the saving faith in Jesus or the second birth of the gospel. Henry was against all that stuff. The Church of England was born out of political corruption and whoredom. That is its heritage. There's no honor in it. He had Woolsey murder Tyndale. William Tyndale, one of the greatest saints of God in the English-speaking world, was murdered at the behest of Henry. Henry's relationship with Woolsey was like Louis XIV's relationship with Cardinal Richelieu. This blend of political and religious corruption of ecclesiastical and political corruption. That's all it was. Now again, I do not deny that there were other people who came and who were martyred. There were people who were martyred trying to reform the Church of England. But that's nothing to do with its birth as an institution or Henry VIII. Dissenting bishops speak out on same-sex blessings. There's about 11 of them. They shouldn't speak out. They should walk out. 
and say that we are going ahead and making our own Church of England. Not yours. We're going to follow Jesus, not the Synod, not Lambeth. Not an Archbishop of Canterbury who will not take a stand. Here's another one. What makes the church safe for LGBT people? The only thing that should make a church safe for those people is no one will harass them when they come to hear the gospel. That'll make it safe, but nothing else will. It goes on and on and on and on, article after article. One saying one thing, another saying another. One in favor of something, another opposed to it. One representing one position, another representing the diametric opposite position. No end to it. There's just no end to it. This is premier. Premier. In its early days, I'd been once or twice invited to speak on premier Christian radio. Of course, it's gone down the ecumenical road. This premier had an article by a comedian who was a Roman Catholic. Of course, it didn't address the issue of Catholicism. These Anglicans never addressed the fact that Catholicism stands in juxtaposed contrast to their own 39 articles. It says nothing about that. Nobody would have the opportunity to ask the Catholic comedian. Are you going to atone in purgatory for your own sin, or you, do you believe what the Word of God says? That the blood of Christ cleanses from all sin. Which is it? They don't want that. They don't want any of that. Here's another one. Why your favorite stories are filled with Christian meaning. Harry Potter. I remember when the first Harry Potter movie came out, I only saw one, and I only went to that movie because our ministry, Moriel, was getting so many letters at that time. Email was not popular use yet. From so many concerned Christian parents wanting to know should they let their children see this film or read these Harry Potter books. And I wanted to be fair and give an informed answer. So I went to see the movie. Among other issues in that movie, there was a talking snake, which the storyline portrayed as something positive. So you get a little kid who's just learning to read six or seven or something. And in Sunday school, or in a children's Bible, a talking snake is something bad. But in the Harry Potter movie, it's something good. Confusion. You're confusing a child. But that's premier. As a Christian, I believe a Gaza-Israel ceasefire is needed. As a Christian, I believe it isn't. Hamas said there's going to be more October 7th. They're going to murder more children, rape more women, kidnap more people. A ceasefire simply gives them the means to do it. To make sure they live to kill another day. I would say wipe them out while you have the chance. They're the ones using their own children as human shields, not the Israelis. The Israelis are taking great pains 
to avoid as many civilian casualties and reduce collateral damage as possible. Now, I happen to know that Israel could successfully end this war very quickly. The only thing Israel would have to do to end this war, as I've said before, is to do what it's falsely accused of doing, killing civilians. If the Israelis didn't care about killing children, they could go in and wipe out Hamas completely within a week or two. They could end it very quickly. But unlike the Muslim terrorists, the Israelis do care about killing women and children. So they don't want to do what they're being falsely accused of. I believe there must be a ceasefire as a Christian. As a Christian, I believe there should not be a ceasefire. The RAF was right to bomb Dresden. The Royal Navy was right to shell Hamburg. The Nazis could have ended the war immediately by surrendering. If Hamas wants that war over, all they have to do is surrender. The terrorists need to surrender. The terrorists who are using their own children as human shields need to surrender to the Israelis. That would end the war tomorrow. What are you blaming Israel for? It's Hamas who won't surrender. They want to fight another day. Therefore, they're calling for a ceasefire before they get wiped out and can't fight another day. And then they say they're going to kill the Christians afterwards. They've openly said that in the media. This is a stupid person, a very stupid person. He's entitled to his opinion, but don't try to make it a theological opinion. There is a time for war. The BBC claims this Hell Evangelist was a cult leader, T.B. Joshua. T.B. Joshua in Africa was worse than a cult leader. I don't like the BBC. But the media reports about T.B. Joshua were absolutely right. Here's some more. The counselor, I'm living out my faith through politics. Where does the Bible say you live out your faith through politics? You can live your faith in politics as you can in medicine, in law, in plumbing, or in refrigerator repair, any occupation, trade, profession. You can live your faith in it, but how do you live your faith out through it? Jesus' kingdom was not of this world. There is no Christian theocracy, although people have tried to make one. Then there's more. It's time for Christians to take a stand against online porn. Here's how you can make the difference. Good article. Good article. Why Christmas is a story of a ceasefire. I've read the nativity narratives dozens and dozens of times. I didn't see anything about a ceasefire in it. Goes on. Madman or martyr. The mission is unsettling documentary about a murdered evangelist. In 2018, the missionary John Allen Chow shocked the world. Now a new documentary looks at what inspired a young American to reach a remote people group with the gospel. Good. Good. David Cameron's return to politics shows. There's a season for everything. 
Notice when the Bible says there's a time for war, no, you shouldn't quote that. But when it comes to a politician like David Cameron, that's different. I don't like David Cameron politically. You may disagree. Nonetheless, he has a bias against Israel. He is a Europhile. And I don't agree with him. If you do agree with them, that's your prerogative. But why frame it in Christian terms? Let's sharpen our spiritual radar. This tiny political reminder is a guide to Christians to seek God's will. Oh, yeah, yeah. Here's a testimony from Islam to atheism to Christianity, the unlikely conversion of Ayan Ersi Ali. That's pretty good. Pretty good. Here's an editorial. Don't be like Braverman. Choose the path of peace. You may disagree with Suella Braverman. I personally agree with her, basically. You may disagree. But to say that people who agree with her are enemies of peace, I would say allowing radical Muslims to come into your country like the Bradford riots and wanting to kill Salman Rushdie and putting bombs on buses and tube trains in London and doing what they've done this very week in, in, in Rotterdam. To say that it's, you agree with her, which some people do and some Christians do, I certainly do, to say we shouldn't be like her, we should be Christian and choose the path to peace. Christians are called to resist the easy option. Tim Farron, MP, choosing to walk the path of peace through the culture wars. There is no peace with radical Islam. This man is saying something that is extremely stupid and has no biblical basis to identify his point of view with the Christian faith. Gay conversion ban was a notable omission from the king's speech. No, Suella, homelessness is not a lifestyle choice. You want to bet? For many people it is. You want to go to a homeless shelter, you can't bring weapons, tobacco, alcohol, or drugs in with you. They'd rather stay on the streets. That's not just a few. The amount of substance abuse and crime associated with homeless people is staggering. When you choose a drug lifestyle, and I'm speaking as a former cocaine addict in my youth, when you choose a drug lifestyle, you choose the lifestyle of the drug. I saw Jordan Peterson at the O2 last night, says Justin Briley. He's asking the right questions. I agree. Watch a pastor helping people escape from North Korea. Anti-Semitism is hitting the streets of London. Christians must be vocal in their opposition. I agree with all that. Peter Grigg. I sense a new move of God in Australia. I don't. I wish I did. I'm going there soon. Haven't been there since before COVID. Many wonderful Christians there. But the only thing of a Christian nature that's happened has been the 
hell song scandals. Oh boy. Stories from Gaza. Should Christians take sides when praying for Israel and Gaza? I've witnessed conflicts between Israel and Gaza before. This is different. Christians have called to follow the Prince of Peace. David Hardman. Yeah, well, here's an article by James Patrick. The media hasn't explained what motivates Hamas. The Corvin says, kill them where you find them. This person says, this is not simply about killing the Zionists. It's about killing all Jews, and then we're going to kill all the Christians, he says. Leader of Hamas, senior leader. Mr. Hardman doesn't talk about that. Mr. Hardman will call himself hard of hearing. It goes on and on. Lauren Cunningham, the YWAM founder, took Christ to the nations. Whether Christ for the nations was ever ordained of God can be argued. In Acts 13, the Holy Spirit said, set out for me Barnabas and Saul. When the Holy Spirit leads people to a foreign mission field, you send veterans. You don't send amateurs. Now, I'm not talking about a problem of a youth mission from a church going down to the third world to help build a Christian school or hospital or something like that. I'm not talking about that. But you do not send young believers to foreign countries to be missionaries. It is not scriptural. The entire YWAM model was flawed. Maybe people were saved through it. God will use anything. But the model itself was false. Was, was flawed. I was saved to a cult, the children of God, but I was born again. But it's a cult. The theocratic nonsense I've seen in YWAM with people like Danny Lehman in America is disgusting. They were in the Pacific telling Polynesians, he's Jesus, but you can call the Polynesian volcano god, Eo, you call him Eo, we'll call him Jesus. Huh? The Bible says do not have the names of idols on your lips. Before missionaries came to Polynesia or Hawaii, they were taking newborn infant babies and throwing them into volcanoes to stop the lava, to placate Pele, the god. The doctrinal ignorance among YWAM members and their discipleship training program, so-called, the people teaching it didn't know the Word of God very well. YWAM was an unbiblical model. It was never too good to begin with, but it ended quite badly. Now, I'm not making any comments on his salvation. I'm not saying Lauren Cunningham didn't go to heaven. That's hardly my place to say something like that. But the Bible says his works will be burned up. When Christians were spat on by Orthodox Jews in the old city of Jerusalem, Israel took swift action. They arrested them. 
Israel actually arrested Orthodox Jews for spitting on Christian clergy, nominal Christian clergy. The only country in the Middle East that protects religious freedom. The Israelis protect the religious freedom of Christians, of Muslims, and of Jews. And they will arrest Jews who violate it as quickly as they will arrest anyone else who violates it. Yet they're made out to be the bad guys. It goes on. Braverman cannot dispense with human rights. They're God's idea. It's George Pritcher again. I've never heard Suella Braverman wanting to dispatch of human rights. I just saw her defending the rights of British citizens not to be invaded by so-called refugees who should be going to other Muslim countries. Jewish refugees should go to Israel. African refugees should go to black African countries. Muslim refugees should go to Islamic countries. That is my view. Britain is getting overrun and invaded. These people go on welfare rolls, contribute to the crime rate, and many of them are radical Muslims. This has happened in Holland, Germany, and elsewhere. Sue Ella Braverman is herself an Asian woman. She says she wants to rip up the UN Refugee Convention. So do I. She's not an extremist, and she's not going against Christian teaching. Who is it? Pitcher again. Here's a good article by a woman, Dr. Sharon James, challenging radical feminism and critical race theory. Here's Holly Anna Peterson again, the one who disrupts church services in the name of the green agenda. Rolling back on green pledges is unchristian and unfair. Is it possible to end poverty? Jesus said the poor will always be with you. It should help the poor, but this vision of utopianism And its pursuit is not to be the primary focus of the church. Our pursuit is the gospel. Should Christians in the UK be worried about the prosperity gospel? 25, 30 years ago, I warned what the Elam movement in Kensington Temple was doing, bringing in people and promoting people like Morris Sorello, who made born again a household joke in America, and Elam was at the forefront of bringing this poison into Britain to discredit the gospel as it already had in America. Yes, Christians should be worried, but they're 25, 30 years too late. The Elam movement and the late Wynne Lewis saw to that and Colin Dye saw to that. Oh boy. When American aviators used the cathedral in Nagasaki to guide the dropping of the atomic bomb that ended the Second World War, they wiped out the Christian community that survived hundreds of years of persecution. Yeah, blame the United States for ending Japanese imperialism. The argument has been made that at least three million American British and Australian troops would have been killed invading Japan. Those bombs, distasteful as their use was, saved a lot more lives. British, American, Australian, Kiwi, and Japanese than they killed. Western Christians must stop talking about unreached people groups. 
Your problem is at home. I think Joseph D'Souza makes a good point that the problem is at home. We have unreached people groups in Britain and America and Europe and so on. But the two, again, are not mutually exclusive. Explained, why was Brian Houston taken to court and why he quit Hillsong? The verdict said he was guilty. He actually did it. He was guilty of the act of covering up his bisexual pedophile father. Didn't deny he did it. It just said because the victim did not want to make a complaint, the charges were assuaged. assuaged. His decision, it says, his decision not to report his pedophile father to the police. The Royal Commission said he did it. The judge said he did it. The reason he's no longer part of the church is not only that scandal, but the substance abuse scandals and the sex scandals of himself and his protege, Carl Lynn, among others. Hillsong is Hillsong. Again, 25, 30 years ago, myself, Philip Powell, the late Bill Randalls, a number of other people warned what Hillsong was. Should be no one's surprise it's ended the way it has. Sad but not sorry. Five lessons to learn from Brian Houston's trial. There's only one lesson to be learned from Brian Houston's trial. Hillsong was Hillsong. Philip Powell knew. Assemblies of God ministers in Australia and New Zealand who knew that Frank Houston was a homosexual or bisexual pedophile. They knew that 35 years ago, but they couldn't prove it. Hell song should never have gotten this far. Now you've got Carl Lins. He seems like he's making himself a victim, the predator. The swindler, as people would say he was. AI can write a great sermon. <laughs> Look at that. AI can write a great sermon. Oh, my Lord. You are going to have people using AI to write sermons instead of the Holy Spirit. Telling them what to preach. I don't mean using AI as a concordance or as a lexical commentary. They're saying AI will write the sermon. Oh, boy. It goes on and on and on. Some good, some bad, some true, some false some healthy, some toxic, some intelligent, some stupid. A confused mess. That is premier. That is the Church of England. That is a lot of things. But it's not the word of God. Never has been. Ours is not a God of confusion. Our God hates the mixture. When you have the mixture, you have confusion. And when you have confusion, the peace of the Lord is nowhere to be found. You don't sell your field with two kinds of seed. You do not plow with an ox and a donkey together. And there's plenty of donkeys writing for Premier.
What do we make of this? What do we make of this? Putting truth next to error. What does God call it? Putting truth next to error. He says false teachers and false prophets do that. Look out for it. What does God say about it? You've got zealous Christians, and you've got lukewarm Christians just going along for the ride. What does Jesus say about it? What does he say? God hates the mixture. Where there's a mixture, there can only be confusion. And ours is not a God of confusion. My name is James Jacob Prash from Oriole Ministries, coming to you here on RTN Christian TV and Radio. Thank you so much for listening. God bless and have a wonderful weekend. If you're in Florida, Los Angeles area, New York, Baltimore, Washington area, Essex, England, or Merseyside, Cheshire area of England, or Staffordshire. I hope we see you in the forthcoming weeks. God bless and thank you so much. Yeah.